Have you ever painted a wall? Painting can be zen. Up and down, load the roller, up and down, but it's also hard work. I had less than a week to prep, prime, and paint before I headed to Texas for Vid Summit. Oh, and did I mention the Raspberry Pi 5 announcement was also happening that week? This studio build isn't a big construction job, but every worker I've met puts in hard work day in and day out. I'm usually down here in my office messing with hardware or editing a video. I mean, that can also be hard work, but it's just not the same. I'm in air conditioning. I can grab a cold drink and watch YouTube on my break. Construction workers do their work a lot of times with no AC or heat. They come out early, day after day. They earn their living building the physical spaces where we live and work. And after painting 2,000 square feet of walls, I'm reminded how important and hard the work is that all the trades do. It's also why I hired out most of this build, except painting. Why? Well, of all the jobs, painting is one of the most approachable. That doesn't mean it's not worth hiring out, though. <laughs> Pros know how to get a beautiful finish and have extra tools and experience that makes the job go more smoothly. But I had a budget problem. Doing my own painting means I can build the studio and not go bankrupt. In this video, I'm going to share some of the things I did and new things I learned for two reasons. One, because you might pick up some new trick that helps you on your next paint job. And two, it's great for engagement. Every time I do something wrong, I know 20 people tear into me in the comments, and one or two comments will have suggestions for doing it better. It's really a win-win. But before that, it's good to stay protected from paint droplets while you're painting. Surfshark might not provide adequate protection from paint droplets, but they do provide protection on public Wi-Fi. I love the encrypted WireGuard VPN I set up here at the office, but my ISP only gives me 30 megabits of upload bandwidth. With Surfshark, it still uses WireGuard, but I don't have that bandwidth restriction. I can get hundreds of megabits. They also have all these locations around the world, meaning if there's a show only available in the UK, I can act like I'm there and watch it. They have some other features too wrapped up in Surfshark 1, like antivirus and identity protection, but I'm mostly here for the VPN. It's simple, it works on all my devices, and if I need something better than my office WireGuard VPN, I use Surfshark. Use code REDSHIRTJEFF for an extra three months free, and in case you're wondering, it's really hard to paint in that costume because the little viewing window on the front moves around as you move your arms. So yeah, Surfshark, good for a VPN, but probably not the best tool for painting your office. Electrical and networking were ready to go soon after the walls were built. The walls themselves have resilient channel to hold the drywall off the wall structure, and there's neoprene rubber to isolate the wall from the floor and the ceiling. The construction guys also placed rock wool insulation above the ceiling and regular insulation in all the wall cavities to help reduce sound transmission from above and from the sides. They also put acoustic caulk in any seams, especially the gap between the floor and the bottom of the drywall. These guys were great, and they also stuffed some extra rock wool in a few wall cavities you can't see behind the new walls to make sure no extra sound makes it through. They also hauled in and put up like 20 sheets of heavy 5 8 inch Firecode X drywall. They're thicker than typical one half inch sheets and the extra mass stops a little extra sound. It was fun seeing how they use their hard heads to express themselves kind of the same way we nerds use our laptops to display our little sticker collections. Anyway, I made sure all the outlets were also surrounded with insulation and had extra neoprene on the standoffs so if they touch the wall behind, the metal outlet boxes won't transmit sound. And with all this insulation in, the studio completely eats up any echo, like a totally dead space. Uh, the sound is actually already pretty decent out here in the office space because of all of this insulation back here. It's actually absorbing some more sound than there was before. But as I walk into the studio space, you will hear uh, quite a difference. And that's because there's all this insulation, there's Rockwell up there absorbing all of the bouncing reflections. So this is kind of a dead room right now. There's really no liveliness, no echo or anything like that. So you want to have a little bit of that, and that's, that's what we'll have to tune after this room is complete. But for now, they're getting all of the insulation up, and there are a couple spots back here that do have some drywall in them. If you have a completely dead room, it's kind of like Gamer's Nexus hemi anechoic chamber. Oh, it feels so different when you come yeah. What an adjustment. <laughs> totally. You spend too long and they warp yeah. your brain. Almost any noise I make is absorbed by all that insulation. That's what I mean by it being a dead space. There's zero echo, and some people say the room has no liveliness or presence. But let me fast forward a little bit into the future. I just finished painting this new studio, and that is a lot of echo. Hello? Hello? <laughs> I hope I didn't waste all my money. Well, I didn't. I mean, the problem is I went from one extreme, a completely dead space, 
here's me talking in the studio space. To the other, a completely live space with tons of reverb. Test check, one, two, testing, testing. In the end, I want something in between. Enough presence so it doesn't sound like I'm in a black hole, but not so much it's distracting. But we'll get to that later. For now, drywall. Drywall is labor intense, and taping and mudding well takes a lot of skill. It's more like artistry than brute force, especially if you want a smooth finish. The process went pretty fast. The drywall guys got the main studio done first, and had enough insulation left over to stick it in all the other walls too. Insulation doesn't do a ton, but it does help. It's better in the walls than a landfill. And in the studio, they actually put the ceiling in last, and left a little gap they filled with acoustic caulk. The goal is to make sure all the structure is as isolated as possible. They cut around all the outlets, and luckily it looks like all my wires are still intact. And you can see how the drywall is actually out from the wall here in one of the door frames. That gap was filled with a little extra insulation and wood trim later. They cut the drywall a little too close to the floor in this part, so the door installer cut it back up a little higher when he installed the doors. And we decided to still not touch this little fire alarm station, since who knows what that would trigger. So the drywall was literally cut to slide around it. Painting around it was fun too. But they got all the drywall up, in the front, the studio, the ceiling, and the back, and it's so nice to see everything coming together. Also a little daunting, because that meant painting was coming up. But not before tape and mud. The first coat is light and just fills in gaps with some tape to keep all the seams together. A second coat spreads out the mud and it starts looking more like a finished coat. A few days later, after a final coat and a ton of sanding, everything was nice and flat. The mudder even filled in a crack in the old wall that was giving me trouble with my cheap little spackling compound. And now, it was time to paint. The door installer came in the first couple days while I was painting too, so I got to watch him trim out the heavy pre-hung studio doors. All the doors are solid wood to block sound, and for the server room, I had forgotten we actually ordered solid French doors. That meant some rework in the opening, but all's well that ends well. And you know how they say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Well, that's doubly true for paint. The only way to get a good coat of paint is a ton of prep work. My dad came and helped me dust all the walls. I bought a floor duster for it, and it didn't take too long, but dust was everywhere. Definitely wear a good mask or respirator when you're doing this. My dad sucked all the dust out of the boxes, and then we vacuumed the floor and rolled out rosin paper to protect the floor from drips of paint. And even though it's expensive, I used gaff tape to keep the paper in place since it sticks to darn near anything and it peels off pretty easily afterwards. I don't have any old shoes to wear right now for painting, so I bought these overalls that cover everything, even my shoes, and got to work on the part that I hate the most, cutting in. I mean, it feels like you're not making much progress, and with these 10-foot ceilings, I had to use a ladder to get up into the corners. Plus, at the end, if you're like me and you don't paint much, your fingers and wrist end up pretty sore. I used a 2.5 inch Wooster sash brush and a Pelican handheld paint bucket. I've also used a handy pail, but whatever the case, I love this magnet that holds your paintbrush up above the paint. If you don't have that, you risk getting paint up in the bristles inside the ferrule. That's this metal part that holds the bristles in place. And if paint does get in there, good luck getting the bristles back into shape. A good paintbrush like this should last a long time as long as you clean it and treat it well. And that I did. After I used it, I made sure to rinse out all the paint and spun it dry with this neat little contraption Purdy also makes. It'll spin paintbrushes and paint roller covers, though I don't always clean my roller covers since I'm a little lazy. For primer, I used Bullseye 123. It seems like a good base for latex paint, and I saw it recommended on some paint forms, so I went with it. Rolling it on takes forever though, because it really soaks into new drywall. So like one load on my roller would only get one roller width on the wall at a time. So it was slow but steady progress. The main thing is to keep a wet edge and keep painting in one direction. This was the first time I used a bucket and a screen instead of a paint tray for rolling on paint. All the painting I've ever done before was like 2 or 3 gallons at a time. So since this project needed at least 15 gallons, I bought 5 gallon paint buckets and a couple extra empty buckets for mixing. I split the paint in half and dropped a roller screen in the bucket. This is actually way faster than using a paint tray. It's harder to spill too, and it's nice having a handle on the paint bucket to move it around. And at the end of the day, it's nice to just drop the roller and screen down into the paint and pick back up the next morning. Just make sure you cover up the bucket with a lid and some press and seal so the paint doesn't have a chance to dry on the screen. When that happens, you get flecks of dried paint and you have to run it through a filter. I also bought this large bag of painter's rags. It's basically old shirt material that's cut into small pieces. These things are handy for cleaning up little drips or swiping little things off the wall while you're painting. I decided to skip painting the ceiling because nobody's going to see it anyway. There's actually going to be a new drop ceiling in here. 
With this primer coat done, the walls started looking even better, but with primer, unless you do two coats and sand in between, it definitely has a bit of an uneven look. The, the main thing is to make sure the whole wall is covered so your paint has something to stick to. I didn't end up sanding down any paint coats, but I'm okay with a little roller texture. A few people asked me why I didn't rent a sprayer and spray the paint on. That's a lot faster and usually gives a smoother finish. Well, I'm not familiar with spraying paint, and in this case it would have meant squeezing the painting into even less time since I was working around the door guy's schedule. But let me know in the comments, should I have tried spraying it on instead? My dad thankfully came to help me on the last day priming and he got the front and back done. He, he didn't think I'd find this clip, but apparently he thinks his work was better than mine. Well, I don't want Jeff to know this, but overall I think I did a better job at the priming of the walls than he did, but I'm older. <laughs> Well, I mean, it was okay, but I don't know if just being older makes your work any better. Anyway, I was ready for finished paint. And for that, I did something I've never done before. I went to an actual paint store. I read online a lot of pros use paint specialty stores and don't actually go to the home center like I do. And honestly, after going there myself, I understand. At the home center, besides the paint aisle sometimes getting a bit messy, there are many days where it takes a while just to get a paint rep at the counter. I don't blame them, I, I mean, usually the paint desk employees are doing 10 other jobs, but it does mean you sit around waiting a lot. Even so, Lowe's actually sells some real Sherwin-Williams paint, and it's not like it's any cheaper at the specialty store, but the experience at the paint store was night and day. <laughs> Instead of graffiti on the floor from people testing spray paint colors, everything's pretty organized, and since they cater to pros, they have all the neat paint equipment to make a job go even more smoothly. The employees were helpful too, though my introvert brain is always a little skittish when an employee kind of latches onto you when you walk into a store. But that's just a me thing. Anyway, it was time to pick out a color. I wanted something like a 20% gray. Some studios are black and some gray, but the main thing is you don't want much pigment in the wall color so you can control lighting more easily. White, like I have in this office, reflects everything and that can get really annoying. Black is great for lighting, but it feels like you're in a void, so I went with this color, and look, it's called software. Fancy that. For the office space, I wanted a brighter color, and I could use a tiny bit of pigment, so I went with Shell. I kind of thought if I was going with a software theme, I could use the Linux Shell for the rest of the space. It turned out a slight bit more yellow than I wanted in the end, but it's okay. I started painting the studio walls first. I wanted to make sure I got down two solid coats of paint, so it was time to cut in, then roll on the first coat. This super paint rolled on really well. I could get maybe one and a half to two lines per roller, and it was quick going down the wall. It was a lot faster than the primer. After I finished up that first coat, you can see where the paint shrunk a little, and there were small flecks back to the primer coat. It's really helpful to have good lighting for painting and inspection, and that's where this massive portable DeWalt light comes in. I love this thing, but it's way overkill for my household use. After the first coat, I dropped the roller and screen in the bucket and sealed it up with press and seal. The next morning, after I finished up cutting in a second time, I opened up the paint bucket, dumped my extra cut and paint in, and went to town rolling on the final coat. It's not as impressive watching a second coat of paint go on, but it sure does look beautiful once it dries. And there were still one or two spots on the wall where I missed little dents, but I'll touch those up later. A pro would probably spot those things while he's painting, but honestly, it's not a big deal for me, and it probably won't even show up on the camera. What was a big deal, though, was how badly I measured my network box on the front wall. I, I mean, I'm not sure how I missed lining it up so badly. Just don't tell the electrician, maybe he won't notice. But I did have to tape up one of his cables though. <laughs> Gaff tape held it up to the ceiling well, but it did rip off a little bit of the drywall's facing, so I had to touch that up too. I also got a little too enthusiastic around some of the door trim, but luckily I'll be painting that later too. I wrapped up for the night enjoying the massive reverb in this room. Echo, echo, echo. The next day, I cut in the back wall and put down a coat of primer since we hadn't finished that room, and I thought it would be cool to see things from the perspective of the roller. Not too bad. My poor GoPro probably got a few flecks of paint on it, but hey, anything for the shot. So now it was time for the final color everywhere outside the studio. I cut in with my sore hand, and I cut in some more and a bit more, and yeah, the cutting in just takes forever. But then I painted. It, it looks a lot more yellow when it's wet. It, it dries to a more eggshell-like color, but it's still got this tinge of yellow I wasn't quite expecting. I, I guess that's why you're supposed to roll a little sample on the wall before you go out and buy five gallons. But the shade kind of reminds me of old deck computers. Maybe I could run with a retro computing theme up in the front. <laughs> we'll see. 
But I painted and cut in and painted and cut in some more, and at this point I was painting late into the night to try to finish up before I left for Vid Summit. And in the end, I decided to stick with one coat outside the studio to save on paint, <laughs> otherwise I would have needed a couple more gallons. Plus, it was like midnight the night before I left, and there was no time left for more painting. Vid Summit was pretty fun, and I got to meet up with Tom Lawrence from Lawrence Systems, Ken from Computer Clan, and one of the many Jimmys from the Mr. Beast Project, among a few other people. But I I'm back now, and next up is the new drop ceiling, electrical, finish trim, and I just bought a new Home Assistant Yellow that I'll be installing soon, so subscribe. And until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling.